Today, I've got just one goal. I want to make cardioid subs absolutely clear for the normal audio human. When we think about these setups, we usually think about getting fancy software, looking at phase graphs, doing a lot of math, and that's all necessary for getting it right, but we often lose the forest for the trees. So I want to give you a high-level overview of what is their goal? What are they accomplishing? What are some of the trade-offs? What are the caveats? How can I spot it out in the wild? We too often try to dive too quickly into the how, and we forget the what and the why. So that's what we're going to focus on, the what and the why, and a little bit of the how. And one resource that is really helpful, I think, will be for you to, to getting some of the how once we understand the what, is my audio math survival spreadsheet. You can get that at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit, along with a lot of other great resources. You can do command F and hit sub. And I've got an inline gradient subarray planner. That's some fancy jargon for how to make two subs stacked in front of each other sound great. All you gotta do is put in the crossover frequency. Uh, you can determine the max spacing. You can find the center frequency of your subs. All just put by put doing some inputs here. And it'll give you the outputs rather quickly. Again, that's at the link below at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. All right, so let's jump right into making cardioid subs accessible for the average normal audio human. Here's our roadmap for today as we simplify cardioid setups and make it approachable for a new audio engineer who's wanting to level up their system design game, or maybe you're doing it a while and just want to have better sounding low end at your shows. So first we're going to clarify the terms. What, what does cardioid subs actually mean? It, that's thrown around a little bit and is unclear. So I'm going to be very uh, pragmatic today and make sure you walk away knowing what those terms are and how we define them. Then we're going to talk about how cardioid subs actually work. This is not a deep dive into a specific con configurations because there's actually lots of ways to get this cardioid pattern with our subs. But what are the underlying principles at play? And number three are some examples. What are these arrays going to look like in the field and how have I deployed them? Number four, the key benefits. It's not worth learning all this math and going through all this trouble to figure out how to get a cardioid subarray if it's really not gonna help us. I, I, I really do think it is. And so we're gonna cover those key benefits and decide when it's worth it at your show. Number five are, are the key cons and caveats. Sometimes it's not a good idea to deploy a cardioid subarray. And what do you have to be aware of when you setting up this array? Because it might require some more processing, some more box. And so we're going to talk about that. And number six is some field data. We're going to take a look at some measurements of one specific cardioid sub configuration and what does success look like from a data standpoint to verify that a cardioid subarray is doing what we're asking it to do. All right, so let's clarify some terms here. So cardioid subs, I do not think it means what you think it means, right? So I, I wanted to be absolutely clear and talk about first, what is the goal of a cardioid subarray? What is it going to do for us? So it's going to steer more low frequencies at the audience and less low frequencies other places. This is the exact same idea of a mains speaker, you know, Sound System Design 101 has put a speaker to where it can aim its energy at the people who need to hear what's going on and away from walls and at the stage. So that's all we're trying to do is to steer our low end away from the stage, away from walls, away from other places that bounce around and get it towards our audience. We are controlling its coverage pattern. Because subwoofers, without any fancy processing or native cardioid capabilities, are mostly omnidirectional. As we move up in frequency, it's easier to physically steer sound, and that's why a nominal coverage pattern on a speaker, let's call it a 90-degree speaker, is usually able to steer effectively from about 1K or 2K and up. But below that, we get a steadily growing omnidirectional pattern. So here is a single subwoofer. I know it shows two right there, but I just have the one soloed. And at uh, 63 hertz is just moving out in this steady orb. So, you, so if this was right in front of the stage and I have a drum kit really close, all that low end is spilling back into that kick drum mic, which is not good. We can get feedback problems. So now is a cardioid sub setup. So this is a specific inline gradient cardioid setup where I'm able to push that low end energy forward and have much less of it 
on the stage. And we are borrowing this terminology from microphone polar patterns. So this is an omni microphone, so it's picking up from all directions, versus a cardioid microphone. This is a C414, which has switchable polar patterns, making it a very useful microphone. So a cardioid is able to make the microphone listen in a certain direction and reject sound from other places. So that's really useful, uh, let's say, on a snare drum microphone. If I have a hypercardioid microphone, it's listening to just a snare drum and can reject some of the bleed from other cymbals and hi-hats. So we're just inverting this idea on its head. Instead of a microphone listening at a specific point, we're making speakers only project to a certain point. So here is a different inverted gradient sub uh, set up. So I know this sounds kind of fancy. We'll get to those words a little bit later, but that would be a stage in the audience. I'm able to steer energy away from the stage and reflecting off the back wall and coming at back in and making it less coherent and towards the audience. So here's a, another picture of a cardioid uh, microphone polar pattern. I've overlaid that on the one earlier now facing north, and that is a similar heart-shaped pattern that we're getting out of our subwoofers. So it's, it's by doing some processing and placement, we were able to get this pattern. So cardioid is the name of the pattern we get from being able to steer the subs in a certain direction. But there are multiple ways to get there. The parent category I would call is a directional sub array because it's not always a cardioid shape that we get. I mean, it can actually do some, some more fancy tricks by doing a cardioid setup, I actually pull our subs apart and I'm able to narrow coverage. So here, I've been able, to, been able to take a lot of energy off the, the, the front wall and off the stage and also make it to where it's not going in this you know, wider cardioid pattern. I'm able to make it tighter and go down a narrow venue. So directional subs would be the parent category. A cardioid subarray is very common and something that we can do a lot, but we can do other things with our subwoofers to, to make it even a little bit different pattern than cardioid, which I would argue this is approaching a super cardioid or hyper cardio cardioid shape. So how do cardioid subs work? There, there are four main things we can do. We can manipulate the spacing, the timing, which spacing and timing are linked, but you can also add digital or virtual delay to a output. We can mess with the polarity of a subwoofer and its level relative to other subwoofers. A caveat here is that there are single enclosure cardioid subarrays, which basically has this whole recipe in one box. But most of the time I'm using, excuse me, multiple enclosures to get this happen get this to happen. So we are wanting business at the front and a party in the back. So business, what I mean by that is summation. So I want energy at all frequencies within the sub range to sum together and add in my subs and go forward out to the audience. And I'm using cancellation in the rear to get energy to not go that way. And how we're doing that at the end of the day is changing the phase relationships between different subs at specific points to get them to cancel. If we look here at the phase wheel, if we have a zero degree offset, meaning they're perfectly aligned at that frequency, either at the zero point or 360 degrees later, we get plus six dB. But as we move around the phase wheel and get more and more offset, so this would be a 240, or let's go 120 degree offset. So that's being later in time. So it's a third away, third of the way around the phase wheel. Uh, if we get past that, we start to get cancellation. So if this is a new idea to you as far as how phase relates, um, you're probably familiar with this, a polarity inversion. So something is 180 degrees offset, or if the two waveforms are tracking completely opposite with each other, that is 180 degrees offset, and then we get cancellation. So most often we're shooting for a within a 120 degree phase span plus or minus for summation in the front, and we're aiming for 180 degree uh, alignment in the back to get cancellation, right? So we can use measurement software like Smart to look at that phase data, look at those levels, uh, be able to fine tune how they're aligning out of phase in the back and in phase in the front to be able to make sure we have that. So we'll, we'll look at a specific smart traces here at the end, but we use software like this to help us make those decisions in the field and get good results. We can also simulate that in advance. Here is two ways, our green uh, sine wave here and our blue sine wave. 
and they are 90 degrees apart. So they are a quarter offset from a quarter wavelength offset from each other. And right here, and if they sum together, we do not get the full 6 dB because any two waves that are equal, equal source and equal phase are able to go up to 6 dB in summation. And so by having them apart, we start to get not as much. We get 3 dB. And if it drifted all the way to 180 degrees offset, they would get complete and total cancellation. So that's what we're wanting in the back. So uh, there's much more of a deep dive in these other two videos that I made on the uh, two specific sub uh, setups that we'll, we're about to cover. So more on the specifics of how it all works, how to think about phase uh, is much more of a deep dive right there. So I'll have links to those or hopefully little cards right here and you can check that out. If not, just go to my channel and you'll be able to find those videos. Okay, here are some specific examples of what these are going to look like. So this is in the video that I covered. This is the inline gradient sub array. So we're going to use delay added to the rear sub, a physical displacement to the rear sub, and a polarity inversion. That's the recipe. Uh, figuring out that specific, uh, the amount of placement here, I've chosen 4.15 feet, how much delay to add, and how it all works. Again, I cover it in that workshop, but that's a, a sub array you're going to encounter in the wild. This is a four element inline gradient. So the acoustic centers of these subs are right here in the middle. So think of it they're going here and then aligning and going forward and out, creating a cardioid pattern. This is a inverted gradient. I can also do this in a stack, but this is a horizontal version. Uh, very similar approach, but they're all here right next to each other. The only difference now is I've also added a level offset because the drivers in the front are going to be louder than the ones in the rear comparative to the rear. This is a super crazy one. This is one of Bob McCarthy rig at the Raskilda Festival. Uh, I stole this screenshot from Nathan Lively's video, so thanks for that, pal. Uh, but this is a three element end fire array, and that's basically having the front sub right here wait for the other sub to fire and get to it, then sum together, and then also wait for that one. And by waiting, it's able to all combine together and go out into the audience, which is great. But because of those timing offsets and distance offsets, we get various degrees of cancellation in the back at different frequencies. We can also do a four element uh, end fire array, which I, I'm going to do a workshop on, so don't worry. But we have all these subs. The one in the front is able to be here and wait and wait and wait. And then it combines all aligned at the front, and then we get cancellation in the back. This one takes up a ton of real estate. We'll talk about those cons in a minute, but it's a really cool one, the n far cardioid sub array. And lastly, you can have a single box that has a cocktail of speakers face in a certain direction and processing that makes it to where you get a cardioid pattern with just one box. This is the QSC-212 uh, KS212C, so it's a tiny little box, but it's cardioid from the get-go, which is pretty cool. So you don't always need multiple enclosures. All right, so that's what they look like in the field. Again, check out those workshops. You've dive deep into all the nitty gritty nerdy stuff with how it makes it work, but we're staying high level today. Here are the benefits of a cardioid subway, being able to steer the energy in a certain way. The biggest one is less room reflections. What that's gonna result in is a tighter sound overall. And so why my voice sounds nice and close and tight to you is that the microphone, which you can't see, is, is, is pretty close to me. I have all these sound panels in here. I'm not getting all these reflections off the walls and making it sound like I'm doing a Zoom call in a conference room. So same thing at your shows. You can't always control the acoustics. If you're in a big arena, it's usually hard surfaces, a concrete floor, all these chairs. But being able to have less reflections makes it tighter, more intelligible. Our brain is able to focus on things better when we have less noise swimming around us. So having less low frequencies radiating out to the room and only steering them towards our audience makes it tighter. We also get more accurate data when we're trying to measure a sub. Uh, if we have more noise swimming out in our audience, our measurement microphones and the algorithms and our analyzers that give us coherent data, if they have less noise, we're going to get better data, therefore being able to make clearer and faster decisions when we're tuning a system. Number three is increased intelligibility. We often think that I, intelligibility happens when I don't have enough top end or clarity for my brain to latch onto, but the inverse of that is too much low end swimming around so that the, the high end has no chance of coming out and making it present to our brain. So all those are three big benefits just from an audience perspective. And if now we turn back to the stage, 
we have higher gain before feedback. And why that is, is we have less low end coming back onto our stages. And so that means, you know, an upright bass here, I'm an upright bass player, so this is really near and dear to my heart. But if you have an open microphone, responsible for pushing 40 hertz and that's all just spilling back on the stage you're just asking for feedback so the very first cardioid subarray that i ever deployed i was mixing for another solo upright bass player who also sang and it was really satisfying to know that i had as much gain as i wanted to because i was pushing my low end out to the room and it wasn't going on the stage and it was really satisfying and i was like i'm sold on cardioid subs this is really useful and band clarity. If they also don't have all this low end swimming around on stage, they're able to focus more and make better decisions and they're not drowning in 50 hertz, which translate to your monitor engineer is not gonna wanna punch you in the mouth because they, they make better mixing decisions when they're not getting pounded by the subs. And they're getting pounded because they're close to the subs. They're either gonna be hung with the big array or down in front of the stage. And just from a proximity standpoint, they're close to it. So they're gonna get hit with a lot of low frequencies. So being able to steer those away and keep your monitor engineer happy is also a great thing to do. Here's our cons and caveats uh, and what you're gonna have to be aware of when deploying these setups, because it's not all sunshine and rainbows. You're gonna need some extra processing. So um, this guy just came out, the Allen Heath HM32, which is a cool piece of gear. I cannot wait to get one, or the production company here locally that I work with a lot is probably gonna get one. I'm super excited, but you need extra processing to make that happen. So in our simple inline gradient, sub setup where it's just one in front of the other you need two separate outputs one both getting the same signal but you're going to need to be able to have a delay added to it and a polarity inversion to make it work so you if you're on an analog desk and don't have any digital de delay lines uh you're out of luck here but there are also subwoofers with built-in delay and level in them now so uh, you're just going to need processing somewhere to make that happen so you have to be aware of that you might also need some extra boxes if you're not using subs that have cardioid capabilities native inside them in a single enclosure. So at Enfire Ray, to do it really well, you're gonna need at least four <laughs> to make that happen. I think uh, you need at least three, but four is a great um, cost benefit analysis of getting maximum amount of energy going forward and a good amount of cancellation in the back, but also takes a lot of real estate. They don't work under a stage. And so if you're also very close to a stage, especially one with a hard front, like concrete or, or steel or something like that, um, the way they need the energy moving from the rear to the back and canceling, it's just gonna bounce off that wall and bounce right back, uh, making the pattern not work nearly as well. So they can't be a, near a hard stage front that's, uh, that's going vertically, or they can't be under a stage or they're not gonna work very well. And, some artists really want low end on stage. I remember uh, Bob McCarthy in that video, I've showed a screenshot earlier of those big three hung arrays. He said uh, they had the Wu-Tang Clan and he did such a good job with his flown array that they, they didn't feel enough low in energy. They had to add a fill sub setup with some side fills. And so you can do too good of a job here and the band might be used to having a bunch of bump or you know feeling it in their chest. So just know that uh, even though you might have done a good job saying like, hey, I, I kept all this low energy off the stage, they may actually want it, which isn't a big deal if you got a hip hop act and no live open microphones to get low frequencies. But if you got a bluegrass band, that's probably not a good idea to have all the low end swimming on the stage. And lastly, um, it looks funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so this one is a four element inline gradient and the one of the hands that would help me set up who also does audio he looked at me and it's just like i was from mars he was like why in the world are these this way and uh, we didn't have time to really walk through it so he probably left that show thinking i was an idiot like why in the world are the subs facing the wrong direction they're stacked like that so most people are going to see your setup before they hear it um, and so just know that you might get some questions if you're de deploying a funny looking array Lastly, here's some data and expectations from a cardioid subarray. This is a we looked at some pretty looking pictures of making sure that the, the energy went into the audience away from stage, but how much reduction can you expect in the in the rear? How can we measure that? It ultimately depends on your setup. Uh, we looked at I think four different ways to do it. And it also changes over frequency. It's not gonna be the same. I wanna say a big thanks to Michael Lawrence and Nathan Lively. Nathan for the, the picture earlier in his interview with Bob. And this is some data I've got from Michael Lawrence. He did a fantastic review of the QSC KS118 sub and it's different patterns. 
And so this is a sub that has a built-in cardioid preset. So all you, get, all you gotta do is put them next to each other like this or on top of one another like this. I know this is not that sub, but this is what it would look like. I also started this from Nathan Lively, so thank you. Um, so I would be able to say, hey, this one's facing front, this one's facing back, and it does the processing for you. It adds the delay line and the polarity inversion to the rear sub and makes it do a nice cardioid shape. So this is, the again, the QSC KS118. You can put them next to each other like that, or you could put them on top to each other. This is the, gonna be the better results of that one. So here is some measurement data from Michael Lawrence, who is a smart wizard uh, in both senses of the word smart. And so the two green traces up here are both of those subs together at the front of the array. And so it, we can get, I think that's plus 16 or 17 dB. And this line right here is we get if they are next to each other, and so not stacked on top of each other, so one facing front, one facing the back, we get, looks like a 10 dB reduction in that mode. And if we stack them on top of each other, that's way down here at minus six versus the peak up here at, let's just call it plus 15. That's a about a 20 dB reduction, which is awesome. And so that's, that's really cool to have a 20 dB less in the rear than in the front. So to clarify, the green traces are, are a measurement microphone in front of the array, and these two red and pink traces is a measurement microphone at these two different setups behind the array. So that's how you would measure the efficacy of your cardioid subarray. Hey, is it, is it louder in the front and a good pattern uh, versus the rear? So again, thank you, Michael Lawrence, for this measurement data uh, of this particular sub. I've done other measurements, but I'm just like, I am going to be using this sub in the field pretty soon. So I was uh, kind of him to share this data with me so I could have it in advance and make sure it was going to work out. And and know if this uh, actual preset was going to hold its weight in the field. All right, so here's our recap, our big points I want you to take home is use precise language. If someone asks you today, hey, are you going to do a cardioid sub setup? You might say yes. You might say which one? Because there's inline gradient, there's inverted gradient, there's end fire, uh, and there's, uh, there's others as well. So use precise language when you're talking about cardioid subs. Because uh, there are, number two, multiple ways to get there. And depending on the processing available, the real estate you have available, the amount of subs are all going to determine which one you end up going with. Can you fly them? You know, so what's the flyware? That all plays into which one you're going to pick. So being fluid with all of them and comfortable making them happen will get you good results and help you move quickly. Number three, the key benefits. I mean, basically, you get more energy at your audience less on the stage, so your musicians can hear better, it's gonna be more intelligible, you have more game before feedback. I think it's all worth it to learn a little math and make this happen. And you have some key challenges. They take up a lot of real estate, they have extra processing, you might need some more boxes, they take more time to tune than just throwing a left, right stack and calling it a day. So be aware of that. And number five is you need to get good data in the field. And so to verify that your subs are working, and it's gonna be a little bit different for each array, it's good to put a measurement microphone maybe six feet in the front of the array and six feet behind and actually make sure that you're getting the results that you are after. If you could let me know below, what is your favorite cardioid setup and why? Is it easy to deploy? Do you think it sounds the best? And maybe if you haven't used one yet, which one are you excited about deploying? Because please go check out the workshops that I have and also get my audio math survival spreadsheet, which I mentioned at the top. Um, it's got several calculations that will help making deploy cardioid sub setups great for you. I'm Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching today and I'll catch you next time.